Hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Sustainable Hoosier Homesteading. Uh, my name is Kathy Sippel. I'll be your uh, moderator, or exactly what my title is. I'm not sure. I'm behind the scenes to work with the technical support. So if anybody has questions, you can question me via the chat window. We will keep the audience uh, on mute this evening to preserve the quality of the recording. This uh, recording will be available on our website via our YouTube channel. You can get to this after the fact and also view all other web excuse me, webinars that we've done up to now. I'm now going to turn it over to our Executive Director of Sustainable Indiana 2016, Mr. John Gibson. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. We have a very important topic. And before we get started with that, however, I would like to give a little overview to let you know where this fits into the big scheme of things. First of all, I'm sure we're all aware of the fact that our planet is in peril. Somehow or another, we humans have lost our way. We have abused our planet home, overused it, underappreciated it, and brought it to a place um, where it is struggling to maintain uh, its vitality. And nowhere is that more apparent than what we call climate change. And <clears throat> we see evidence of the consequences of that uh, every day, in one way or another, to the point that more and more people are waking up to the fact that uh, the planet uh, is in jeopardy and uh, are, are trying to do something about it. And uh, we have two panelists tonight who are doing just that. There are challenges that we face uh, here in Indiana. Uh, we are uh, a state that imports 90% of its food, and yet we are one of the biggest agricultural states in the nation. Uh, we are a state that uh, powers itself electrically with about 90% coal-fired power plants. And 90% or more of our waterways are, are polluted. Now, to be fair, there are people that are working on all of these things. We are making some modest improvements. And so uh, that trend is good. And if we can keep that up and accelerate it, we have the chance of, uh, of restoring some of the greatness and the beauty of our beloved state uh, to the point where we can all live better and the, and the, uh, the land and the water and the air uh, will be cleaner and healthier. Our two panelists tonight are going to talk about a very important uh, way that some people are working on this. Um, the word that has come into my vocabulary lately is called permaculture. I have in front of me a, a book by Ben Falk called The Resilient Farm and Homestead. And there are words that pop out here like biodiversity, regeneration, resiliency, uh, viability, and thriving in the future, partnership. And some of those words will play into the conversation tonight as we listen to uh, our panelists, uh, Janet Glover and Randy Jamrock, talk about their experience in uh, sustainable Hoosier homesteading. I'm going to ask Kathy as she will introduce each of the panelists to us and then turn it back to me and uh, we will get them uh, uh, before our audience. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll go ahead with Janet first. And Janet Glover is a farmer who is at uh, Lone Balsam Farm, and that's in Rooshville. I hope I'm saying that correctly, Janet. 
She and her husband, Rod, moved there in 1976. They raised their three children there. They have been organic gardeners from the start and had dreams of self-sufficiency. They now have, they have transitioned over to raised bed gardening and now currently have 25 raised beds. We're going to get to see a picture of those beds for those of you who are joining us with a web link. And they have some large in-ground planting areas as well. They uh, try, you know, in their dream of self-sufficiency, they're trying to grow as much of their own food as possible. They have also transitioned over to renewable energy in many ways. They've installed uh, 40 solar panels on the roof of their barn just last year. And they also heat with an outdoor wood furnace that's EPA approved. And that heats their uh, hot water all through the winter. They have some critters out on the farm too, chickens that are there for eggs only, rabbits and horses named Spirit and Sky. And the horses and the chickens manure also becomes a vital part of their fertilizer with uh, you know, their composting efforts. So that is Janet, and hang on just a second, and I'll introduce you to Randy. I want to bring his slide up as well. OK, Randy Jamrock I had the pleasure of meeting, oh, I guess it was not quite a year ago. We met at a gardening meeting up here in northwest Indiana. Randy is from Highland, Indiana, which for those of you who don't know where that is, it's kind of in the far northwest cor corner. He is a permaculture designer. He has earned a permaculture design certification from Midwest Permaculture and has also studied permaculture with Austrian rebel farmer, Sepp Holzer, at an urban permaculture workshop. He was a presenter at the 2013 Michigan Permaculture Convergence and also lectures throughout Indiana. He will be presenting at the International Permaculture Convergence in Cuba later this year. He designs permaculture projects all throughout the Midwest, and he's interested in all endeavors related to collectively redesigning society for permanent agriculture and permanent culture. So welcome, Randy and Janet. Thank you, all right, Janet. thank you. Uh, hey. Thank you. We are going to, uh, we're going to do this uh, tonight in two rounds. We're going to ask Randy and Janet uh, to give us a kind of a word picture. And for some of you who are sitting in front of your, your uh, computer monitor, you can see these things visually. But I would like to have uh, Janet start out. And Janet, I uh, presume that uh, uh, you are walking with me uh, for the first time uh, onto your property. Tell me what I would see. What are the sights and the sounds and the smells uh, that are just very, very visible? as uh, as we uh, enter your farm? Well, if we were just entering, it would be out in front on the north side. And the first thing you'd see would be the pasture out in front that we just finished fencing for the two horses. And that would be off to your right. And there it is. And right in the middle, you see the balsam fir tree. And that is where our little farm gets its name, Lone Balsam. Uh, a tree that was given to us by dear friends many years ago. And so it's a, a very cherished part of our little farm. And that's that pasture you see is where we fenced for the horses. Um, off to the side <coughs> in that pasture, there are fruit trees that have since been moved. When we planted them there, we didn't realize we'd have horses. So since we have moved those fruit trees to another location where they'll be able to grow and not be eaten by the horses. And as we would go up the driveway, you would see the house. And then you'd see the barns. And we just passed that picture of the barns. <laughs> there we are. Uh, we, there is a smaller barn out in front for the horses. And on the right-hand side, there is our big barn with the solar panels that we installed last year. And you can see our raised bed gardens out there in front of the barn with sweet potatoes in the front and strawberries, and then on behind tomatoes and many other beds behind. You can also see a view of that from that I went on the roof of the barn and took so that I could show them a little bit better. And uh, raised bed gardens are, we found that we really like using raised beds even better than in-ground planting. So uh, those are our raised beds and we keep adding to them each year, building a new one and putting it in where, wherever we can find room. We do have fencing around the garden and it is uh, electrical fencing that's powered by solar fence chargers because Groundhogs, deer, rabbits, 
raccoons and other creatures would eat everything we grow. So those fences are really a vital part of what we do. And back behind the garden in the shade are our compost heaps that are continually working. Some of them are finished, some of them are just in process, but that's, of course, an important part of uh, our system. The little barn you see to the left at the back is, well, it was our old maple syrup barn at one time. Now it is a small barn that has equipment stored in one end, and the other end we recently renovated so that it's a, a extra barn for the horses if we want to move them to a smaller pasture in back. And over the years, we, we've planted gardens forever, it seems like, but at one time they were just in the ground. All this area was in ground, and we were growing as probably most people do. But once we began raised beds, we found so many advantages. So we really feel that that's been a, a great thing to do, is grow in raised beds. And the yield is very good, and somehow it really does seem to be much easier than in ground planting. It seems that there's much less weeding and, and what weeding we have to do is somehow seems very much simpler than the way it was before. Uh, the solar panels on the roof of the barn, we've had those for one year now and that's been one of the greatest things we ever did was installing those panels. They produce more than enough electricity for us, at least when it's sunny, um, during the summertime when there's ample sunshine. Sometimes during the winter when it's more cloudy and maybe not as many sunlight hours during the day, we won't produce quite as much, but we have been extremely happy with them. There are 40 of them, each one rated at 240 watts, and that has been a long time dream, so we were really happy when we finally got those installed, actually last November, so just one year ago. It's been just a, a fantastic addition to our homestead here. We're really happy with it, very much worth all the effort that it took to do it. And I don't know if I'm missing anything, John. If you think of anything else I should add, just let me know. Well, I actually had the pleasure of visiting your homestead with my sister Judy. And one of the things we noticed when we drove in, walked around your place a little bit, was a, a car that looked like it was hooked up to an electric uh, outlet. Can you explain that a bit? Oh yes, we have, and maybe I, I don't know if I should mention the, the company that made the car, um, but it's a plug-in no, no, hybrid. Right. Oh, okay, well it's a Chevrolet Volt, it's a plug-in hybrid, which we, we've been very happy with. Uh, it plugs in, and we have a 240 volt charger so that it charges within about three hours, so of course it's, it's running off of sunshine, which we really, really are happy with. And during the summer, when the batteries are more efficient, we get up around 50 miles on completely on battery. And then it switches over to hybrid, where it switches back and forth from battery to gas, battery to gas. So mm -hmm. during the winter, when it's colder and batteries aren't quite as efficient, it drops down to about, oh, 38 or 39 miles on pure electric before it switches over to hybrid mode. But it's been just a great car and we're so happy to be able to fuel our car with sunshine. You know, what more could you ask for? So that's that's another thing that we had long dreamed of and it was really another dream come true to be able to do that. All right, well that's a, a very good word picture. Let's turn to uh, Randy uh, and, uh, uh, and get filled in a little bit about uh, what you see, hear, and smell when you walk on your premises, Randy. Okay, sure. So, um, so yeah, I just live actually in a small suburban house uh, in Highland, Indiana, and I think I measured it once, and it's about one sixty-fourth of an acre garden space. So that's pretty small. Um, our goal in in doing a garden is really to have a kitchen garden something that we could uh, use in cooking and in eating at home, but also in order to like develop a connection with the natural world. Um, I personally use the design system of permaculture. And um, uh, permaculture is a design system. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, I use permaculture system to get more and more yield with less and less work. 
Uh, that's the goal. And so um, I do that mainly by design and also by planting perennial-based food-producing plants. So if uh, anyone doesn't know, a perennial plant is one that makes it through the winter and can last many years, as opposed to an annual plant that uh, dies back in the winter and you have to replant. Um, I think some of our accomplishments have been uh, producing a variety of food that we can't get in a store. For example, uh, I grow the Paul Robeson tomato, which is a certain type of tomato. And also, uh, sunchokes is a perennial uh, plant. It's a tuber. And uh, as you can see here, this has got different, a lot of different kinds of tomatoes, eggplants, squash, some radishes. And I think it's also a better quality food you can produce at home than you can buy in the store. Um, and also, I have complete control over the production and harvest of the food. I could ensure that, for example, it doesn't, or chemicals weren't used to grow that food. Um, so also, even though we have a small space, we use a permaculture perspective on limitless yield to always be looking for opportunities to put in more plants or find opportunities for a, a new yield. So for example, uh, Bill Mollison, one of the co-founders of the permaculture concept, he says, uh, there's a quote, he says, there is always room for another plant, another cycle, another route, another arrangement, another technique or structure. And that quote is from Permaculture Designer's Manual. It's kind of the Bible of permaculture. Um, and then if I could talk real quickly about uh, one or two special features of our setup. Um, so number one, we try and use permaculture water management practices, which is instead of artificially irrigating, um, we do have some rain barrels, but uh, the better way to hold water on the landscape is natural methods. So for example, some of those are uh, using mulch. Uh, in these pictures, you don't see very much bare soils. Uh, if you have bare soil, you're likely losing water to evaporation and, uh, and that, uh, so we mulch as much as possible. Uh, we also use space uh, as densely as possible uh, through polyculture. So instead of planting 20 radishes in a couple square feet, we'll put uh, uh, different plants together and we could use space better and that ends up conserving moisture too. Um, we try and develop deep root uh, plant uh, deep root systems in plants. We um, we also use something called deep rooted plant symbiosis. So we have plants in there. One example is the plant comfrey, which we don't eat it. Uh, it is a medicinal plant. You could use it. Uh, it's called knit bone actually, and has been used in the past for uh, healing, although. Uh, it can be poisonous too, so you have to be careful. But we don't eat it. What its value is, it has a very deep taproot that can bring up moisture from deep in the ground and release that moisture to plants around it that have maybe shallower root systems. And then one more real quick uh, thing I'd like to talk about is the hugel culture. You can see in uh, the two pictures on the left. So hugel culture is, uh, it roughly translates as hill bed. I believe it's originally an Austrian concept, and um, basically it's a trench that you dig, uh, you can see on the very far left, and you put in woody organic matter, for example, logs or uh, branches, uh, tree trunks even, and then you cover it with soil, and uh, in the second picture you can see some mulch over it. That's right when it was planted. The reason for putting the wood in that bed is that um, the wood will wick up water, it will store water in it, get soaked with water, and then the plants can access that water. Um, the wood also will break down slowly over time and so it will be releasing nutrients uh, on a consistent basis to the plants. Um, uh, in, in addition, the hill, since it's built up on a like a hill bed, it gets a lot more oxygen, and oxygen is good for growth of plants. Um, it's, it spurs the bacteria and microbial life in the soil. 
Um, and then one last thing about it is it uses a lot of edge. And edge is a very uh, important concept in permaculture. Uh, edge is the area that uh, is most productive in a system. And so if this space was just flat, you would only have that much space. Um, but if we make it a hill, we're actually creating more contour and more surface area. And uh, so we could plant more things in it. And also, it'll create various microclimates. Um, and then uh, I guess one last thing is we try and use vertical space as much as possible since we have a, a, a very small lot. We could really, by growing up, we could increase our yield. So you see the picture, the hops picture here. And uh, on the whole east side of the house, on the other picture, we had vining, bind, uh, vining, bind, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> vining bean plants as well as vining squash plants. And this year we put in some uh, groundnut plant, which it's uh, a kind of tuber that's perennial. Um, and so we just try and use space as wisely as possible there. So I'm looking at these pictures, and I'm thinking that your your home doesn't probably look like the others in the neighborhood. It looks like it's uh, lush with uh, green and growing things, climbing things. Um, am I right about that? Yes, you are right. And it's funny because we kind of live in a uh, uh, interesting area. Um, our neighbors do kind of uh, value having like a really tidy lawn. And so our house is very different than that. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, we live next to a apartment house that's rented out. So that those neighbors are going in and out every couple years. And also we're on a very busy street. So the front yard uh, we have kind of a more perennial flower garden. And so in the backyard, it's kind of a little bit isolated. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, having such a lush backyard, it really gets us outside. Before we had the garden, we never really would go outside for any reason except to mow the lawn. And now that we have it, we spend a lot more time and run into the neighbors more. So there's a social component to it. We get food from it. Um, and it's just more enjoyable as well, we find. Okay, uh, you said you had a small lot, probably one sixty-fourth of an acre, if I heard you right. Correct. Janet, we didn't uh, uh, ask you how much land you have there for your farm. Well, it's, I guess, small by farm standards, but it's um, about 1.7 acres. So it gives us plenty of room to do all the things we want to do, though I have to say we are running out of space and trying to fit more things in and figure out how to make them fit. So we're talking here about a farm that's just a little under two acres and another and a, a, a suburban homestead that's uh, uh, hardly a dot on the map when you stop to think <laughs> about it, one sixty-fourth of an acre. I'm guessing um, that's about a standard size lot, Randy, isn't it, uh, in, in your area? Yes. So uh, there you have it. Uh, maybe what? I think it's maybe uh, 50 feet by 100 feet. 50 or, by 100, that's a standard yeah. lot, right. And you're not talking about having a side lot. You're making all that happen on your lot that uh, your house sits on. Correct. Yeah. Okay, well now, we've got that initial description, and I don't know, Kathy, have we had any questions come in yet from viewers and listeners? Um, if we I, don't, I, then uh, you and I can ask questions, or they might ask questions of each other. We'll have just a little dialogue here before we launch into round two of this conversation. Sounds good. Um, Samuel typed part of a question. Samuel, I might need you to elaborate a little bit more, but he is from Gary and he just planted his first herb garden this year. And it looks like he was just curious about water conservation at the individual level. He didn't exactly phrase it as a question, but uh, you know, Randy, you mentioned uh, rain barrel, I believe. Do you want to give a few tips about water conservation? 
Um, sure. I mean, I guess we have the rain barrels for mostly for like some potted plants that we have. Um, but in the garden itself, uh, I try not to really have the need to water. Now, sometimes that's not always practical, but um, permaculturist Paul Wheaton talks about the importance of putting plants through what he calls a boot camp, plant boot camp, which is um, basically letting the plants uh, 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 be in nature. And for example, not having to water the plant daily. If you water the plant daily, typically you're going to be sh uh, putting water in a very shallow area, and the shallow roots are going to, you know, not have to work hard to find water. But if, on the other hand, you make the plant rely on when it rains, that plant's going to develop a deeper root system because the roots are going to be uh, searching for water deeper in the ground and then that plant's going to be more resilient. Um, so I think that's an important concept um, for, for like... Uh, Janet, you have uh, uh, rain barrels too. Tell us a little bit about how you deal with water. Yes, we have rain barrels and we have them sort of, uh, I guess, as just an extra so that we have that stored in case, in case there's a need, we need to bring water to, to some part of the property. Uh, for our raised beds, we usually put out soaker hoses, the, the black, porous kinds of hoses. We lay those, lay those flat on the ground in and around the plants. But the main thing is that we use a thick mulch over that, usually straw, sometimes leaves. And that mulch, just like Randy said, the mulch is so important because it holds in the moisture and just makes a huge difference in, in conserving water. And if it does get really dry, which sometimes it does, you know, the hot summers we've had in the last few years, then we can turn on those soaker hoses, which are very efficient because they drip the water directly down onto the ground. It's not evaporating like it would with overhead sprinklers. And the uh, mulch that's over the top of the um, soaker hoses keeps all that moisture down, holds it in, and the soaker hoses allow it to just drip down into the soil, and we water deeply that way so that, just like Randy said, we're encouraging the roots to grow deeply rather than uh, up to the surface where they are shallow and the plants aren't as healthy. So it's, I agree with Randy, mulch is extremely important. We use it everywhere. We do have a lot of questions coming in. Is it okay to move on to the next one? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Charlotte in the South Bend area is interested in Janet's water heating and Katie from my neck of the woods is asking about the cost of solar panels. Okay, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, with the water heating, we have an outdoor wood furnace that runs all, well, all during the heating months, whatever those months might be. And it is called a hydronic furnace. It heats water in a boiler that is then piped underground into the house. It goes through a coil inside the air handler here in the house, uh, just similar to an air conditioning coil. And then air blows over that coil with the hot water in it to heat the house, and that hot water also goes through a heat exchanger on our water heater, and that heats the water all through the winter. So the water heater is never using electricity through the winter. It, it works so well. It's just great. And through the summer, when we're not running the furnace, our solar panels can run the water heater when we need it. So that has worked out very well, using the, the furnace during the winter, and then in the summertime, the solar panels take over. So we're able to heat our water without having an expensive water heater sitting there using a lot of electricity from the power company. And did I miss anything there, Kathy? Oh, I think you did pretty good. Did you did you mention the cost of the solar panels? Oh, the, that's I knew there was something else. The solar panels, uh, we bought them from a, a great company. I don't know if I should mention any company name, so I, I won't if I shouldn't. But we bought them from a great company. Our salesman was wonderful in helping design our system. and. For the panels and the microinverters, uh, there's a microinverter on each panel, and there, there are good reasons to do it that way. Um, it cost a, about 25000 for the 40 solar panels, the microinverters, and the racking system. And then maybe another oh, three or 4000 for the structure that is back behind there that actually attaches them to the barn roof. 
So it was, it's, well, maybe a big expense in the beginning, but we felt worth it. And often we are asked, well, how soon will you make your money back? And we always say, you know, that was not a consideration. Making the money back from them just was not important to us. It was just our dream to be able to do that, to be more self-sufficient, and more importantly, to try to give back to Mother Earth. Rather than taking, trying to give back and leave a legacy for our children and their children, rather than just taking we like to work as much as we can on giving back and, and not taking more than our share. Great. And I do have a follow-up question from Charlotte about the, uh, the outdoor heater. She's asking about, uh, or the outdoor stove, I should say. She asked if, how do they burn? Uh, she was under the impression that they might be a little bit dirty or might, you know, have some air, air pollution issues. Well, that's why the, there were issues with that, and when we bought ours, the company that made ours had just uh, begun making these that are EPA approved that meet certain air quality standards. And so we waited until we could get that kind of outdoor wood furnace. And in fact, the company tried to sell us one that was an older model, and they kept saying, oh, but you could get this more cheaply, and we, would, we wouldn't charge you as much. And we said, no, 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 that's not what we want. We want the EPA approved one. In fact, this one is better than EPA standards. And that was important to us because we did not want to be causing air quality problems. And we have no problem with it being dirty or causing any, any, any difficulties here as far as air quality. But that's, some of them do. If they aren't uh, more up to date, then they won't have met these standards for clean air that ours has met. So looking for EPA approved is, is something concerned consumers should look for when they're... Right, right. <laughs> Good. And then we have three more questions that kind of cluster around a theme. They're from uh, Katie and Marie. Uh, one is starting your seeds indoors, you know, tips about that, and then asking, do either of you have a greenhouse to extend the growing season? Kind of related. I'll just clump these together because I think they all address extending the season or preserving the harvest one way or another. Uh, the other question was about what do you think of having a root cellar and do either of you have one? So how do you make the season last? Randy, do you want to tackle that one first? Sure. Um, well, yeah, as far as like extending the season, we have best with uh, like cold frames, which is just basically you could make one really cheaply using a window and just a little box, maybe some uh, from some old scrap wood. Um, and so you could put some plants in there before the, uh, before the last frost happens in the spring. And then you could also use it uh, in the fall before the first, or after the first frost. Um, so we've used that, again, we don't have too much space. But I, I would like to say as far as starting seeds, uh, we just start some seeds in the windowsill. Um, but one reason I really love perennial plants is you don't have to worry as much with starting seeds. Um, you know, uh, starting seeds, we, we use annuals mostly, um, or, you know, when we're starting a, maybe a perennial plant. But once a perennial plant is in the ground, it goes for years, and it comes back again and again. And there's a lot of plants that are perennial that are food-bearing. Asparagus, strawberry, uh, drills of artichoke. Uh, there's just a lot of things. Um, so I guess that would be my uh, suggestion to kind of look into that more. Great. We do have a request. Um, somebody does want to know the name of the, the solar uh, system. So John, I don't know, are you okay with that being I'm shared? I'm okay with it, absolutely. Okay. okay, the name of the company that we bought our equipment from is Wholesale Solar. And uh, they are located in California and they are just a fantastic company. We've been so happy with them. Great. And then there was another follow-up question from Marie. She asked if the solar system was off the grid or tied into the system. It is grid-tied because, <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, a battery system is another very big expense. But not just the expense, but it takes a lot of maintenance and time to keep batteries going. There can be difficulties with it. And when those batteries wear out, which they eventually do, then you have the problem of you've got to recycle them. And so since that was very expensive and not as um, maybe not quite as sustainable as we wanted to be, we decided to go with grid tied. We have um, net metering, which means that when we are producing more electricity than we're using, our electric meter runs backward. So it's giving us a credit. In effect, it's sort of storing our electricity on the grid. Then at night or on, let's say, a rainy day when there's not as much produced, if we're using more than we're producing, then the electric meter turns forward. And hopefully, we have enough time with it going backward that when it does go forward, it uses only as much as we have produced. So that's, that's what we have done because we felt net metering just was, was really an easier and a better way to go for us. Great. And then uh, Katie had a question. How many chickens do you have? Uh, do you barter with any neighbors or only produce enough for your family? Well, we have 10 now. We did have 30, and uh, a while back, a few months back, we decided, well, we need to sort of make some changes here because we had 30 chickens, we had turkeys, we had beehives, and for various reasons, we decided, okay, with just the two of us, and we need to make a few changes, and, and John already knows this, I wanted to add horses to the homestead too. So we made some changes and took it down to 10 chickens, which... Of course, at this time of year, they don't lay as much. But when they're laying, we get plenty for us. I share with my family also. And we have bartered with neighbors. Sometimes someone will say, oh, I need some eggs. And, and they will have something they give us. Or perhaps they've helped us out in some way in the past. And I say, oh, here, take some eggs. You've already, you've already done things for us. So here, take these. So it's, it's great to be able to share them and to not only have for yourself, but to be able to share that out with neighbors and, and friends and family, too. I'd like to put in a plug, too, for easy ways that even non-farmers can barter, and that's uh, food swaps. That's something that I've started attending this year. I'm just kind of wondering if anybody on the call has been to a food swap. It's a place where you can can food and trade with other people that come. So there's no cash involved. Everybody just brings their extra harvest that they've preserved. You can bring foraged foods, foods you've grown. Some people bring eggs. That's a lot of fun. Sounds great. I would just like to jump in at this point and say <clears throat> that uh, these kinds of swaps and preservation and <clears throat> self-reliance uh, along with sharing are the hallmarks of sustainable communities going forward. Uh, I think we all know on this call that um, there are two challenges with climate change, uh, <clears throat> and one of them is preventing catastrophic uh, disruption of ecosystem that will be almost impossible to live with. But the other one is preparing ourselves to uh, adapt to the change that is upon us now and is going to be upon us for several years to come. <laughs> And as I size up the situation, this sense of community, this sense of working together, uh, this sense of, of, uh, of measuring your life not exactly by money, but by uh, relationships, uh, <clears throat> will be key to surviving and thriving. And maybe that means that we should move on to the second round of, uh, of presentation here. I see that our time is going, but it's been very very productive. And some of these things uh, have already been answered, but I wanted to hear from both of our presenters what the experience is like living on your homestead. And by that I mean <clears throat> what kind of effort is involved, what kind of satisfactions do you uh, get from doing it, uh, what do you consider to be the advantages and the challenges that you face um, from season to season. Could, uh, could you speak to that? And let's start with Randy this time, and, uh, and uh, we'll then go back. Each of you take about five minutes to talk about your experience, please. 
Okay, sure. Okay, sure. So for me, um, although gardening is a hobby, permaculture really is a way of life. Uh, what permaculture is, is it's a design system. So it's a system where we observe nature and uh, we extract the basic principles by which nature creates sustainable systems from. So for example, like a forest. A forest doesn't need people to be sustainable. It's self-sustaining. So we look at those basic principles and we extract them and then we design human-made systems using those pr same principles. So for example, food systems, uh, sustainable shelter systems, and as John was talking about, sustainable community systems is a big part of permaculture too. Actually, Bill Mollison uh, and David Holmgren, the two founders of the permaculture concept, they knew early on that we could not redesign our entire food system to be sustainable if we did not have what they called permanent culture or a sustainable culture. Uh, so that has to do with uh, social permaculture, community building, our interpersonal relationships. Um, as far as my perspective on, like, I guess how I live and um, what I've gotten out of both gardening and permaculture is I, I see my life as having two parts. Uh, one part is in the individual actions and decisions that I make. And the second part is uh, the community actions and collective actions I'm involved with. So for example, individual actions I see as relating more to my own personal happiness to a degree. They have the power to make me make my quality of life better. Um, also with individual actions, I can make choices that impact my own life, but also the lives of people I'm in relationship with, uh, people I know personally. Um, with community actions, though, and collective actions, these are what it takes to uh, redesign systems. And that's uh, what permaculture's main goal is, to redesign a food system so it's sustainable and we're not degrading the soil from year to year. Uh, create shelter systems that don't uh, waste resources and destroy the planet, and as, as well as uh, community systems. So although I do strive to live my life ethically, uh, the three grounding ethics of permaculture are care of planet, care of people, and fair share. Um, so I, I strive to live that way through my own actions. I think what's most important and what's most neglect neglected in our society is our community actions uh, and like collective organization that only that has the power to change uh, you know our com our community or on a community level our daily lives. Um, so for example these include like participating in real democratic groups and <laughs> For example, redesigning our food system. Permaculture's answer to that is a perennial food forest-based system. Um, unlike uh, industrial agriculture, uh, I'm sorry, industrial agriculture system that we know to be unsustainable. Um, another example of that would be creating like sustainable and fair housing systems. Um, like in, just in my community, I have many foreclosed houses that are just going empty uh, right on my block. Uh, and it seems just a waste of, a waste, a very bad design and a waste of resources. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's ask then, uh, uh, thank you for that uh, insight. Uh, uh, Janet, uh, what's it like uh, living on your farm? What do you experience there? Well, it's we love it and wouldn't trade it for any other kind of lifestyle. But I will freely admit that it's hard work and it's work that is never really done. You may finish some certain chores on one day, but the work is never done. There is always a list of chores and it's always things that maybe you can wait a while to do them and other things that must be done now. But it is never-ending work 
And so I, if someone were asking me, oh, is it, if they were thinking that it's just, you know, an idyllic, easy, fun sort of rural lifestyle, well, it is wonderful and we love it, but yes, it is hard work. There are animals to feed and to care for and it doesn't matter if it's raining or if it's snowing or bitter cold or blazing hot. You have to get out there and take care of those animals because they depend on you. And the same for the gardens. The gardens would die if we didn't take care of them. And a lot of people think the garden season ends, for instance, right now. But for me, it never really ends. Because even now, we're planning and working on next year's gardens. I'll be starting seeds indoors in, oh, probably in March. So once we begin starting seeds, we're taking care of them, getting them ready to transplant to the gardens, then the gardening season, which goes into late fall. And someone mentioned about greenhouses or hoop houses. We have had hoop houses, but they were, they were in a place where we had to take them down. We've also used low tunnels, which are great. We have some cold frames. And sometimes I will even just take, for instance, the spinach uh, and put some double row covering directly on the spinach and it will come through the winter. So we do quite a few things to extend the season, starting it earlier, making it end later. And we thought we'd build a permanent hoop house at some point, but we just haven't gotten that done, and we are running out of space. Someone mentioned a root cellar, too, which is really one of our goals. We seriously need a root cellar because we have so much produce, potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, winter squash, carrots, and many more things that we could really store in a root cellar. It's difficult to do without a root cellar. So that is one of our goals for sure, is to uh, have a root cellar. And I also do a lot of freezing and canning to make all of that garden produce last. And yes, it's all hard work. And there, there are some days when you think, oh, I can't take one more step. I just can't do one more thing. Or you wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm still tired from yesterday. But you get up and do it, and it feels great. And the reward is not only that you have your own food that's organically grown, you know where it came from, you love sharing it, and you love giving it to your family, and it tastes better, and all of those things that we think of when we think of organic produce. But there's just that feeling inside of knowing that I'm doing something that matters. I can't change the whole world, but I can change my little part of the world. I can do things that make a difference. Instead of using chemicals like our, we're surrounded with out here in the rural area, we're gardening organically. We're living sustainably. We're trying to do our very best. And who knows, maybe someone else around in the area sees it, and maybe they want to try it too. But at the very least, our children and grandchildren will know that we kept on working and we tried. And no matter what else was happening, it was important to us, and we made a real effort because it meant something to us. It's just, it's a matter of giving back, of doing what you know deep down is good for the earth, good for everyone who's here, and it just feels good to, to do what you know is going to help Mother Earth at a time when she is desperately in need of our help. Well, that's a terrific uh, witness that both of you have made. And <clears throat> So I'm going to want, uh, ask Kathy now if there are any other questions that some of our listeners and viewers have, have raised uh, to kind of close out our program. I think we've done a pretty good job. There was just one concerned question from Marie. She asked if either of you were affected by yesterday's storm, and she hoped that you were not. Well, we actually, we were very concerned here because we are out here in the rural area, open fields to the west, and this where we live has traditionally been an area where tornadoes come through fairly regularly. So the more we watched the reports, we decided to go to one of our daughter's homes because she has a full basement. So we took a few items and left, knowing that we might return and find nothing left. Thankfully, that didn't happen. There was no damage here, but the tornado that hit Kokomo also went just four miles south of us just a little south of Rusheville, and did a lot of damage out here in the rural area. In fact, we had trouble getting home last night because we had to come through an area where there were power lines down and building debris scattered over the roads, and we had to keep taking detour after detour to find a way to get home. But we were so thankful. Our farm, our home, everything was safe and survived with, with no 
damage. And our hearts do go out to all those that suffered damage yesterday because it was certainly a sad day for many. How about, how about you, Randy? Did you have any wind and damage up your way? Um, there was a lot of downed tree limbs, but uh, no, uh, in Highland we weren't affected. Um, but I am very excited to be going to Cuba because the theme of the International Permaculture Convergence this year is building community resilience to uh, climate change, specifically hurricanes and things like that, but I think would be applicable to tornadoes. And, and so I, I hope to go there and learn a lot and then bring it back to my community here so we can build communities that um, at least have some resiliency to, to these horrible climate events. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, probably, if, they, uh, if the trends continue and the scientists are on target, which they have been so far, we're likely to see um, some increase, at least, in both frequency and intensity of, of storms and, and uh, floods and droughts. Um, and I think both of you would agree that the uh, chances of us um, surviving and and uh, uh, getting along has to do with the way we relate to the earth, the way we relate to each other in community. And you two have proven yourselves to be excellent examples of that. I want to close tonight by asking each of you just to give um, two or three sentences of advice to newcomers, people who want to do something like you are doing, uh, what would be your advice for them getting started? Why don't we start, Janet, and then we'll end up with Randy. Just a okay. few words. Okay, well I would say, for any newcomer I would say, think of what you really love, what you really want to do, whether it's uh, you know, herb gardening or vegetable gardening or maybe you want fruit trees or whatever it might be that the person wants. And start small because if you start big and try to do it all, it can be just overwhelming and, and it may feel like, well, I can't do this, so I'll just give up. Start small, go one step at a time because that's, that's what we have really done. Start small, go one step at a time, don't give up. Just keep on working at it and give yourself time to reach your goals. Okay, Randy, what are your words to the, the newbies? Yeah, I agree with what Janet said. And also, I would say learning by doing. That's a key permaculture uh, concept, is that, you know, we could read books and get ideas from books, but there's nothing like uh, learning through actually doing what you're trying to do. So get some seeds, throw them out in your yard, and then, uh, you know, learn what you can from that, and I, I guarantee you'll, you'll be inspired by what you produce. One last question. Uh, if someone wanted to come to your location for a look-see and a walkabout, um, uh, would you welcome that? And uh, what arrangements would people need to make in advance? We know that you have busy lives, and, and uh, we can't just drop in any old time. But uh, would you have a suggestion? Would you be open to, to site visits occasionally? Well, I certainly would be. Uh, John, you know, you were here visiting that day, and it was just a great visit. And I would be happy to, and my husband would also be happy to welcome people and show them around and answer questions. And uh, they could, well, I'm not really sure how they could contact us. I'm on Facebook, so that's one option. But um, maybe somehow through Sustainable Indiana 2016, they could make contact. I'm not sure about that part. OK. Um, well. Facebook, uh, uh, what is your Facebook address? What would it's you, how would just my name, you? Janet. I'm Janet Glover, and so that's, they would just have to look me up and, and uh, find me by my name. I'm there. OK. And I would offer this idea that if that doesn't work for anybody that wants to go see Janet and Rod on their farm, you could contact Sustainable Indiana 2016, and we'll make the connection. Uh, how about you, Randy? Okay, yeah, um, I'm actually kind of in transition right now, so I might be 
uh, moving soon. Um, I'm in my parents' basically house. We share, you know, uh, garden responsibilities and all that. But I would be open possibly to uh, a walkthrough, especially if I'm here in the spring. <laughs> Um, but Facebook's a good way. Actually, on Facebook, I'm Randall Jamrock, R-A-N-D-A-L-L. -L, um, or I would share my information with Sustainable Indiana. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, well, then, um, that's just uh, fine. Kathy, would, uh, uh, you have been recording this call, haven't you? So that if anybody wants to uh, uh, review or tell their neighbor, uh, tell us how we can access it. Sure, John. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I am Kathy Sipple, and I am the statewide social media coordinator for Sustainable Indiana. So we are always trying to document our webinars and share stories that you might pass along to us of sustainable successes across the state. So you can contact us via our website at sustainableindiana2016.org. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Sustainable Indiana 2016. We're also on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is SI2016. And we do try to append the hashtag SI2016 uh, sometimes when we're talking about our events or our special news. So you can do a, a Twitter hashtag search for SI2016. Or if you want to add that hashtag to your own tweets, that will let us know that you'd like to you know, have us put it in our stream. <laughs> Uh, our YouTube channel is accessible via our website, so you can simply go to the website, click on the YouTube channel that's up in the upper right-hand corner, and again, that will take you to this recording and all the past webinars that we've done. I think we've done now three besides this, and they've all been very good. This is something that we plan to do monthly, the third Monday of each month. So you can look for those events via our hash, excuse me, via our uh, social media channels. And if you've signed up with this via email, we'd also love to keep you apprised of future uh, events via email if we have your permission to do so. So I think that's about it. Again, it will take me about a day to get the, the video up and running, but I will get it processed just as soon as possible. Anything else, John? I think that's, uh, I think that's it. I was trying to find a way for all our listeners to give a round of applause. So I'm going to do it on behalf of all those who are listening. Uh, thank you, Randy. Thank you, Janet. Uh, blessings on you, your family, uh, your life going forward. Um, you have inspired me tonight. Uh, I have learned some things. Uh, I want to learn more about this. I want to bring permaculture to the retirement community I live in. Uh, so. You may be uh, hearing from me again for some, uh, for, some, for some advice. And I know many people on this call tonight um, uh, are, are in that uh, same quest. Uh, some of them may, uh, may be far down that road. But uh, it's been a good evening. So thanks again. Good night to everybody. Um, take care and have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs>